Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Slideshow Friday. And today we find ourselves in the Sahara Desert, or where are you at, Reed? Today I'm in Asila on the, on the Atlantic coast. Excellent. So what we're going to do today is take you on a little uh, trip around Morocco. We have so far featured a few different Moroccan guests. We did a live virtual tour yesterday in Marrakesh, uh, and we hope that we're getting you excited about Morocco. But today we're actually going to show you what our tour looks like day by day. And even if you don't ever plan to travel, you'll at least get a kind of a sense of virtual travel. So are you are we ready to go, Reed? Shall we get going here? We are ready. So before we, we head out, uh, what are your favorite destinations uh, in Morocco? What are you most excited about? Well, you, you kind of have to exclude where you are right now, right, with the Sahara in the background there. I mean, being out in the desert, it's, the, it's just so magical. So, so removing that as the obvious first choice, um, gosh, I haven't even thought about my second choice. I think perhaps Chef Shallon just for the total immersion experience. It's so charming. And as you're gonna see in the pictures here, it's the, they call it the blue pearl. Um, it's not an exciting place to do things. It's just a great place to be and sort of uh, absorb Moroccan culture. So I guess I'd say Chef Shallon. Excellent, well, let's get started. Okay. Have you given me control? Let's see if that works. Yes, okay. Oh, I got lots of choices here. Not that one. Okay, can you check to make sure I've chosen the right screen, Sarah? <laughs> uh, well, it says my screen sharing is paused. Why is that? All right, I don't have any control on my screen here. Let's go with this. Come on. No luck. Yeah, I think I chose the wrong window as always. I don't know why I have so many choices here. Let me just try this. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm having to start over, but we should be there soon. Let's start the slideshow from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. There we go. All right, Reed. Well, Thank you, patience, everybody. Let's get going. Okay, but how does that look? Are you still are you seeing the one with the preview screen, or just Morocco uh, with our names on it? Sarah, you're muted. Go up to the display settings. Yes, I'm seeing the preview of the next slide. Okay. All right. I don't know why this is so complicated. It's just my karma. Um, Swap presenter. All right, now I think we are there. This I promise this will all be worth it, everyone. <laughs> so we start off with a a a map of Morocco. I'll use my pointer here, my cursor. Uh, basically, what we do uh, on the tour is the north of Morocco. We start up here in Rabat, up in the northwest. Uh, loop up to the north through Fez, all the way down, just to the right of where the last O is in Morocco is where we have our desert experience in Marzuga, over to Marrakesh, and then back to Casablanca. So it's sort of a loop of the northern half uh, of the country there. So that's where we are headed. We start off in Rabat. Uh, this is just a colorful shop there in one of the uh, main streets uh, in the um, 
uh, in the Medina, the old town of Rabat. And this is, by the way, is something you can see in any town in Morocco, not unique to Rabat, but uh, it gives you a little preview of how fun the eye, ca the eye candy is everywhere you go in Morocco, just uh, for fun things. I don't know if you'd need to buy a tea set, but, but if you did, you are, uh, you've reached tea set nirvana when you get to Morocco. In terms of sites that we see in Rabat, um, the first thing we visit is the Chela. Um, the Chela is a, a medieval fortified Muslim necropolis. Um, the site was used uh, going back to uh, BC times and when the Romans were around in the first century, they're the ones who built that wall that you see there. So this is a, an archeological site surrounded by a wall. Um, there's storks who have nested on top of every uh, abandoned tall building there. So it's, it's just a fun exploration. And then uh, we move on to the Al Hassan Mosque, which was an, a mosque that was never completed. That's the Hassan Tower in the background. And you can see that Rabat is right there on the Atlantic coast. You see the sea off uh, in the distance. And um, there is a, a rather significant tomb here, the tomb of Muhammad V, one of the kings of Morocco is buried here on site at the um, Al Hassan Mosque. This is the honorary guard outside of the, the mausoleum. And this is the gilded dome of that mausoleum. So a couple of fun kickoff sites in Rabat. Um, but to be perfectly honest, we start in Rabat because it's a, a major city with a major airport uh, and a good kicking off place for us. So it's, it's not as site driven as as all the other uh, places that we like to visit in Morocco. So I would like to just jump in and say that Mar I think Rabat is a brilliant place to start a tour actually, uh, because Rabat is such a nice combination of modern, but also of a little bit of a taste of sort of the real ancient feeling that you're gonna get other uh, elsewhere in the country, don't you think? I just, Absolutely. I was a little surprised by it. Yeah, I mean the Medina is 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 similar to that in in Marrakesh. It's just not as expansive. Uh, you know, there's the the little neighborhood down by the sea that's a little bit like a Sila. So yeah, it's it's a it's kind of a little taste of Morocco and a, as you say, a nice combination of of modern and uh, traditional. Now I, I want to take a few slides um, this week. I keep talking about Morocco's. Uh, progressiveness, it's, it's moderate approach to Islam, and it's great infrastructure. So I thought I would show a really boring photograph of a street, but look at that street. It's clean, nice sidewalks, no broken pavements. This, when I keep saying great infrastructure, this is the sort of thing that I'm talking about, right? Um, and, and another practical image here, this is the courtyard of a Riyadh, right? Riyadhs are former palaces that have been converted into sort of hotel slash guest houses, I guess you might say. And because it's such a traditional accommodation in Morocco, um, we, we want to stay whenever we can in one of these riads. So they um, every riad is uh, uh, organized around a courtyard. So this is the riad that we used in Fez. I, I don't know if it's the same one you had, Sarah, but um, the, the problem is with our groups of you know 22 and 24 people, Riyadhs quite often don't have that many rooms. So we can't always stay in a Riyadh or we would because they're just lovely. Here's a, another shot there. Sometimes we're actually split between neighboring Riyadhs. Like in Marrakesh, we've been split between two that were owned by the same family because these are former mansions essentially that were owned by families. So they've just right. converted them. But this is such a lovely way to start if you get it. And we always make sure we have at least a, one Riyadh if not multiple. Uh, and they really give you a nice feeling. Another thing to note about the accommodations, they are as modern as anything you would find in Europe, actually. So I think that your point was very correct, showing the very boring picture of the street. We have this image of Morocco being something from another time. It's super modern. You'll have Wi-Fi in your hotel. You'll have wonderful hot showers and modern accommodations. They have a TGV there. They literally have the TGV, just like Paris. So right. yeah. uh, I think it's a surprise for people. Yeah, I, th th I think if you've not been to Morocco, you think of it as a developing world country. And, and in some ways, that's partially true. But for all the ways that count, it's, it's very modern and very, uh, very well advanced. Um, this is just the little dining room in one of the Riyadhs that we use. Right? We're not going to put you on an old broken down bus. Right? Right? All the modern conveniences. 
and then um, before I launch off into the, the other stops on the tour, I want to take some moments to talk about uh, Moroccan food. This is mint tea, which is absolutely ubiquitous. Uh, um, uh, Atika yesterday on our virtual tour was talking about how merchants are going to invite you in for a tea and there's no pressure, right? That's just part of their culture, part of their welcoming culture. Sure, they, they'd love to then sell you something, but there's not going to be a hard sale. But, but mint tea is, is so much a part of their culture. You're going to be having lots of cups of mint tea, even if it's not something that you've uh, particularly enjoyed in the past. Uh, typical sort of tagine style uh, food. Uh, um, I, this is not a great picture, but sometimes my pictures have a purpose. I found this uh, stall in the uh, the uh, souk, the marketplace or bazaar of um, of Rabat, um, that was. People were lined up for these blended drinks, and you can see that it's sort of this off green color. And I, I wasn't clear, but I just got in line, right? I didn't know what it was. I got in line. It's an avocado smoothie is basically what that is, which sounds nauseating to me, but it was, I don't know what else they put in it, but it was absolutely delicious. And I thought, this is great. They, I, I bet this is something I'll see everywhere we go. I never saw it again. So when I get back to Rabat, I'm going to have to go on a treasure hunt to see if I can find that, uh, that little uh, stall in the soup to, uh, to have my avocado smoothie again. You know, I did find that avocado smoothie, Reed, because you raved about it, and it wasn't a lot, actually. No, I found it in the Daddy's Gorge. There was a restaurant that was just specialized in avocado smoothies. It tastes like a milkshake. Oh, you never told me that. I'm so glad. It's 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 surprisingly good, isn't it? it is. Yeah, 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 exactly. You raved about it so much that I kept yeah. my eyes open. Yep. <laughs> okay. All right. Guilty as guilty as charged. Uh, camel burger, right? We're going to make sure you get a chance to have a camel burger during the tour. Um, I don't know exactly what this is, but wow, you know, um, bread every, in every shape and form you can think of. These are dates and um, uh, what's it? Why, why can't I? Figs. Figs on the left, dates on the right. Oh, I think it's reversed for your screen, everybody. Dates and figs. Sweets everywhere you go. Fruit, man, pomegranate here, but all kinds of fruit, fresh orange juice everywhere you go. This is the little mini breakfast buffet in one of the Riyadhs. Just, I mean, you know, I remember when I was uh, working in hospitality industry, the chefs would always say, you taste first with your eyes. I mean, look at this. What an enticing little spread for breakfast there. Okay, the, enough of infrastructure and food. There'll be more food as we go along, but uh, I just wanted to introduce us to that. Um, when we leave then Rabat down here, whoops. That's making my screen change. Why can't I? Here's my cursor. Okay, so from Rabat down here in the bottom left, our actual destination on the first driving day is Chef Sawan, which is Chef Shawan, which is up here in the upper right. But we make a stop in Asila on the coast on the way. So I wanted to show you that on the map. And of course, you can see this is the, the northern, northern tip of Morocco with uh, Gibraltar and Spain just across the strait there. So this is Asila. Um, Asila uh, is, it was a is a fortified seaside town. It has a long pedigree. It was established, I think, around 1500 BC by the Phoenicians, you know, who of course were the great ancient traders of the Mediterranean world. Um, and uh, was taken over um, <clears throat> by, the, by the Portuguese, right? Uh, starting in the 15th century, it was a pirate uh, base for a lot of the time and eventually became part of the modern Morocco. So you've got these these fortified walls all along the seashore there and then this beautiful whitewashed town. Um, here's part of the fortification. But this is what I love about it and I don't really know the story and Sarah you can jump in if you do but but no. the, <laughs> the lo okay the, for some reason the locals have just taken it upon themselves to make all these beautiful colored murals like the one behind me this one that I'm showing you. Um, and, and there are really dozens and dozens of them, right? I'm just going to show you a handful, but you can see they're beautiful. Um, they're, they're lively. They're, it's, just, it's just fun. This is really a glorified uh, potty stop, right? On the, on the road. We, we stop, wander on in, give everybody half an hour to poke around and take photographs and then the, and, and take a bio break and then back on the bus and head on over to Chef Shao. And that's the same shot that's behind my head here. 
wanted to make sure I had a picture of a garbage can for some reason. <laughs> we had a nice lunch there, actually. It was kind of a, a fun little seaside stop for lunch. Okay. Um, yeah, I think the, the first time through, we tried to do more on that day and, and um, we just sort of blew through there. But yeah, a nice, nice, nice place for lunch. But this is the second half of the driving then. Um, you got to kind of go around the mountains, you know, so up and around to get down to Chef Shawan, which is our, our destination at the end of that first driving day. That and as I said, the that Blue drives, Pearl. Sorry, Sarah? Beautiful. Just wanted to mention that that drive is like the most surprising, one of the most surprising days. And I think it's the first very big surprise for people on the bus because they don't expect Morocco to be like the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> and that's what you see that day, right? Oh, yeah. It, I, to tell you the truth, there, there isn't a driving day on the tour that isn't, that isn't lovely, right? That's, that isn't a, a pleasant day of scenery going by on the outside uh, of the bus. So Chef Shawan, the Blue Pearl, you can see why. Um, I, can't, I can't remember the story about why they chose to do the blue, but basically in the, in the old town there, right in the Medina, um, all the buildings are at least partially blue. And it's just uh, a, a photographer's treasure hunt, right? It's just uh, every, every nook, every corner, every alley is, is colorful with the blue uh, pigments. It's just... Um, this, this is the one that I chose as my, my secondary uh, site after the Sahara, um, just because of this, you know, the feel of it here. Uh, it's, it's actually quite famous for shopping as well, but uh, um, I, just, I just loved poking around taking pictures there. And I've, I've got hundreds that I had to, you know, narrow it down to just a handful for the PowerPoint here. There were a couple of different reasons that our local guides gave us for the, the blue color. And one was uh, to keep the buildings cool because it reflects the heat very well. And the other one was about something to do with mosquitoes, that it somehow repels mosquitoes. That's what the, the local guide said. But Well, you know, um, I've, I've heard the same explanation for, for blue uh, buildings in the Netherlands. So mm -hmm. uh, about the, the flies is what, what they supposedly repel in the Netherlands. So there, there must be something to that. Whether or not it actually works or not, there, there must be some reason that people uh, believe that that works. Yeah. Um, again, this is, this is something that you would see pretty much anywhere in Morocco, but of course with the blue walls, it's even more colorful, a little spice shop here. And you can see some henna patterns there for sale. Uh, plenty of fun little Moroccan tchotchkes to buy. And then, of course, uh, uh, the Casbah as a, uh, an anchor to the Medina. By the way, just to, to clarify terms, I, I know that before I went to Morocco and even after I'd been there a couple of times, um, I was confused. So Casbah is the fortification, right, is the fortress. Uh, the Medina is the, the greater old town of, of a Moroccan town or city. And a souk or the souk is the marketplace or the bazaar within the Medina. So just to, to clarify terms there. Notice the sign up above there. There's a Riyadh right there on that beautiful little street. I love, I love taking pictures of people, especially when the people are interesting. And, and I would say that India and Morocco produce the most interesting faces and, and costumes and people. I don't know what that says about the broader culture uh, or, or whether it was just the randomness of when I had my camera out, but um, I've got a few shots of people here. This is our, our guide Tariq and these, these young school girls just you know, zeroed in on our tour group. Uh, and uh, you know, they sort of pushed this, this poor gal forward here to be their spokesman. Probably she spoke the best English of them, but Tariq is basically translating. He's asking them a few questions. We've got an exchange back and forth. It was a really fun cultural connection moment and, and a spontaneous one. But here's some more Moroccan faces for you. Not all in Chef Shawan, by the way, I've taken liberties here. Um, okay, from Chef Shawan, we move on heading south. 
Um, our ultimate destination is Fez. This is not a long travel day, as you can see. Uh, we also stop in Meknes, and then just outside of Meknes is uh, Volubilis, one of the uh, really nice Roman archaeological site uh, in Morocco. Uh, and this is Volubilis. Um, I don't have too much commentary here. I think most of you that are watching have probably been to some Roman sites and know a little bit about uh, Roman architecture. Of, of course, they invented the arch. Well, uh, there's some, some dispute about that. If you ask our local guide in, uh, um, why can't I say it, Volterra, you might hear something different about the origin of the, of the Roman arch, but we've always attributed that architectural innovation to the Romans. Got the triumphal gate here. That's very, very typical. What I would comment on on this is that uh, th this is a, a city that is kind of late Roman Empire. Uh, there was a, t a period later in Rome when there were emperors from foreign lands, uh, African emperors. So uh, Septimius Severus, if you know that emperor, this is the place that he came from. Uh, so when you look at things that it's the architecture is not as fine as maybe what you would see in mainland Italy. Uh, it's a little bit more, I guess, provincial because it was a provincial town, essentially. But what really struck me as somebody who spent half of my life practically in Roman ruins is how big the site is and that it is relatively well preserved. And I just had no idea of the scale of North African Roman cities. And this isn't even on the coast. That's what I found very interesting about it. It's really quite inland. Uh, and also in your, your slide there, they have the, what is it heron's nests or, uh, or pelican nests? They're, they're Storks, everywhere. Storks yeah. I think. Storks, yeah. I don't know what what brand of storks, but it's these are the ones that bring the babies. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I was just about to say, uh, you know, my my knowledge of of Roman architecture is pales in comparison to yours, Sarah. But I've seen a lot of Roman ruins around uh, Europe, and uh, the the site itself just uh, compares very favorably to any other individual site, uh, any that I've seen anywhere else. What, what remains, the variety, um, the scale. Um, it's, it's really, a, it's, a, it's a fun stop. There's our, there's our stork buddy. Um, nearby Meknes uh, has a very, very ancient and famous uh, city gate. Um, <clears throat> this is the Bab Mansur city gate. So we got to stop and take a little photograph here. This is where we usually uh, have our camel burger experience. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the tour morphs as we go along. I'm not even really sure what you saw on this day, Sarah, but um, this is part of the ruins um, of the, um, the imperial city there. And, um, and then this is part of the, the, um, the stables that were part of that imperial city. Um, but I know that, that there's, the, there's the mausoleum of, uh, of uh, Moulay Ishmael, who was a very, very important political figure in Moroccan history. His mausoleum is there. The last couple of times I've been there, that was closed for restoration. But um, I, I, I'm blethering on here uh, only to say, we'll stop and see something cool on this day. I don't, I don't want to make any promises about what it might be. But here's just a couple of images of those things. Oh, this is where we... Um, had our little camel burger, right? S sort of a hole in the wall place there in Meknes. Is that where you had yours, Sarah? Or did you guys arrange that somewhere else? Actually, the people who owned that restaurant uh, invited us to their home. So <gasps> we ended up having camel burgers in their home, which Better. was... Yeah, it was such a beautiful experience. They had uh, their home was laid out in a perfect way just to accommodate just the size of our group. And it was it was so comfy and they brought all these different condiments to put onto the burgers. Uh, it was really, really cozy. It was a beautiful experience. And they were such gracious people. Yeah, there's there's nothing better. We were talking about this on Monday. Uh, um, uh, you know, that, that this is a part of Muslim culture and, and, and Morocco is a great place to have that experience where you're very likely to be invited home with somebody and you shouldn't be afraid to go. Uh, and it might even happen to a group of 18 or 20 of us. So, Yeah, question is, uh, what do these taste like? And the, I would say the camel burgers taste like a burger to me. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, I think it's all about the spicing and stuff. So it's, it was, I, I would call it a, a spicy hamburger. And I don't, by that, I don't mean spicy hot, just sort of, you know, just, just a little bit different tasting, but more like what they put on it than the meat tasting that much different. Yeah, it's just a meat burger. Right. 
Uh, destination on this day is Fez. Uh, I, I almost, I, I was tempted to say Fez when you asked me what my favorite place was in, in Morocco. I mean, you know, and, and then if I thought a little further, I might say Marrakesh, right? There's, there's an embarrassment of riches here. Um, but this is, um, this is the overview of Fez, or the, the Fez Medina, or the Fez al-Bali, right? That's the, the, what they call this ancient part of Fez. Um, and um, either the first night or the second night when we're there, we go to this exact vantage point uh, and have a drink at sunset, just looking out over the Medina. Uh, and the Medina of Fez is um, I think the most labyrinthine uh, of all of Morocco. It's the one that's the easiest to get lost in. Again, we were talking about it on Monday with Ayub about uh, what to do when you get lost. Um, we certainly won't turn you loose in Fez without uh, uh, giving you good information about uh, staying, keep, keeping from being lost and what to do if you do get lost. But there are some absolutely fascinating things to see and do in Fez. And I think the number one thing is the, the leather dyeing quarter, right? These are uh, uh, big vats in which they're dyeing leather. So, and you can see the people in there, they give you a sense of scale. Uh, these are probably six feet, six, seven feet across and you see all the colors and stuff. Uh, just, just a fascinating process to see them dyeing the leather. And they, they climb right down into these into these vats. Here's a little bit of a close-up. And uh, of course, um, the smell here is not very pleasant, right? The, the, the tannery smells are not uh, uh, pleasant smells. So the, the Moroccans have a, a, a way of overcoming that. Um, when you enter the quarter, somebody will hand you a little sprig of mint, right? And you kind of keep that close to your nose wherever you go. And by the way, this is a good shot too of, uh, you know, some of the goods that they're making. Of, of course, you're invited into these places to see the, the, the leather dyeing vats, and then they want to show you all the goods that they're selling, their leather shoes and purses and jackets. Uh, and it's, it's fun, even if you're not much of a shopper. Then throughout the rest of the souk, uh, there's, there's every imaginable little handicraft going on. I, I, this guy's, I don't know, he's obviously selling scissors and knives, but I'm guessing he's got his, his grinding stone down here in the corner. He probably services uh, those items as well, keeping them sharp for everybody. Here's a guy making copper pots by hand. This guy's just selling sweets, I think and about ready to chase me away, I'd say, based on the look on his face. Now, people are always uh, very welcoming there. They don't mind, you know, you do want to politely, you know, point to your camera and ask if it's okay, but people are, then, then you usually get the big smile. So here's the, the silver works. I, I, on my tour, I think uh, the first time through, we visited this actual shop. Um, and uh, yeah, here's the, the silversmith who's actually doing some hand work uh, on a on a plate. Um, the thing about Fez is there's so many handicrafts. We'll always pick two or three to visit, um, you know, uh, to just sort of see the handicraft. And of course, they're always, you know, they'd love for you to buy things. Uh, our tours are not shopping tours, but we know that a lot of people enjoy that. So we want to accommodate that a little bit. And this is really the great place. Fez and Meknes are great for uh, making those arrangements. I think we did um, we did ceramics and I think we did tie, a tile workshop and it was they were beautiful it was really interesting but again it's one of those things we just go for the experience of seeing how they do them and you know we don't pressure anybody into buying anything I right. yeah I, I and think we make sure we go to places where they clearly understand we don't want our groups to be pressured so um, nobody needs to have any sort of anxiety about this uh, I think this is a thread shop just in a courtyard there in Fez. And this is the garbage truck. Uh, the, the other things that we visit, apart from just wandering around in the labyrinthine streets uh, there of the old city, um, we visit uh, a madrasa, right? A madrasa is a religious school. I think this is Madrasa El Atran. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I think it's just sort of the whim of the local guide, uh, which one he'll pop into. But um, look at the beautiful detail work in these, in this place, right? I mean, it's, 
uh, Islamic art is always about forms and symbols, not, you know, you never see a painting of a person. And then we visit uh, uh, an 18th century merchant house that's been turned into a little museum. This is the Funduk al Najrian. Um, obviously, that's where they were weighing the goods. Again, a, a totally different feel architecturally, but, but just as beautiful, different medium, right? Wood instead of the um, plaster work. That's not the right word, but um, what we saw before in the madrasa. And when we're ready to move on, we are heading, this is the, this is the really long driving day of the tour. I don't wanna try to spin this. Uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a long driving day. We break it up as best we can, um, but the payoff is the destination. Uh, we're, we're headed down to the desert here. So from Fez, we go over a part of the uh, mountains here and, um, and then all the way down to Merzuga where we have our, our desert experience. The first night upon arrival, we, you know, after that long driving day, we want to have a, a, a nice, relaxed, comfortable evening. So we stay in a, in a Riyadh right there on the edge of the desert. And this is the view off the terrace of the, of the Riyadh. You see those, those sand dunes that come right up to the edge. Um, and they, they're referred to as the Erg, Erg Chebi, right? Uh, sorry, Erg Chebi, which translates to dune sea, right? This is just uh, sand dunes for as far as the eye can see. Um, the next day in the morning, um, we go and, and um, uh, visit the Nawa people. This is a, an ethnic community that lives there on the edge of the Sahara. Uh, they're a very musical culture. So we meet some of these folks and then they do a little performance for us, get a little bit of mint tea um, and it's, it's nice fun morning of activities. And then we head out. Oh, that's right. This is also a place um, that uh, there are many, many ancient fossils that have uh, been found around here. So we, I, on my tour, we took 15 minutes and went and looked for fossils and it was pretty much everybody found a few. But the reason we're here is to head out into the, into the sand dune sea and uh, ride on the back of a camel here. So here's my group loading up, getting ready to go. And, and, and mounting a camel is an experience. I don't want to describe it because I want to, <laughs> if anybody joins us in Morocco, you should just have that experience uh, without too much preamble. You can see everybody's pretty excited to go here. And then you just get these idyllic shots. I'm going to stop talking because you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and so I would have to come up with an awful lot of words to match up with these photos. This is my favorite shot, though. I have to say that much more. Just a, a line of camels along the ridge of a dune, just right out of a thousand and one Arabian nights. I would say, Reed, that this is probably one of my top travel experiences. Uh, ever. I mean, just that because we had lunch and then the, the bus took off, all the all the buses took off. And then when we got outside of our uh, Casbah for lunch, there were sitting the camels and we rode those into our uh, camp for the night. And it was almost like I felt like we had it was like watching a movie or being in a movie, just the way that grand entrance on Camelback uh, yeah, yeah. to your hotel and our luggage was there waiting for us. It was just really magical. And the colors, I mean, the colors you just can't even see in these photos, the bright blue and the bright orange. It's so beautiful. I've got some pictures coming up that do a little better job of that. But of course, as as you know, we don't need to explain to anybody you can't capture the moment in a photograph pretty much ever, right? Even if you're a National Geographic photographer, I mean, you can come up with great images, but the experience is so much more. Well, just to explain also, you don't know, need to know how to ride a camel because what they do is they put you on the camel and then they lash them together and then there's a person who leads them. So you don't have to worry that you're gonna end up roaming off into the Sahara. No, we'll, we'll take good care of you out there on the camels. Here's, here's the shots that I was thinking of where, you know, the, we, we've stopped, they've laid out blankets for us, the sun is going down, you get that golden hour, you know, that last hour, 90 minutes of, of sunlight where all the colors just pop. Uh, this is part of a group here. 
Look at that. That's a beautiful shot. I, I love this shot yeah. with the camels in the background. That this, if I had to pick one, it was that first one I mentioned where we're all on the camels on the ridge. That one and this one sort of do the best job of capturing the magic of this experience. And I'll, I'll say again, you know, I said it on Monday. Um, I, as a tour company owner, I'd been trying to have this sort of idyllic sand dunes, camel, Arabian nights experience on, on, on a number of tours. You know, I've ridden camels in India. I'd ridden camels in Egypt. It was always fun, but it, Morocco is the place where we really get that magical experience, the way your travel imagination uh, has imagined it. Sarah was talking about the arrival in the camp. You know, you arrive, yeah, you're a little bit dusty, of course, you've been on a camel in the Sahara. Uh, but look, you get the hot tea when you arrive. They build a nice campfire for us. You sleep in a tent, but it's pretty darn comfortable, right? It's, it's a tent, right? It, it, but you have your own facilities in there, right? Your own bathroom and shower, uh, a comfortable bed, welcoming presence. And then this is the big uh, dining hall, right? It's just a, a big tent where you have dinner. And I don't know, maybe it was the experience uh, maybe it was the ambiance, but I, I thought that this meal might have been the best one that I had on on the entire tour. I don't even know what it was, but uh, you know my memory's not that clear. But I, I just there was the romance of being out there made the food taste especially good. And of course, you know you can't promise it, but you're likely to have a pretty nice sunset. And I was really lucky to have a full moon my first time through there. All right, ready to move on again, heading back west, back back away from the desert, back through the mountains. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, our, our goal on this driving day is where's uh, Azat, which is not easy for me to say. Um, Sarah says it better than I do, um, which is I basically- it, actually, Because uh, Tariq actually never, he, he gave us a good way to remember it. Where is Zazette? Where is she? Where's Zazette? <laughs> So where's is that? I, you know, I part of my problem was I thought it was a Q at the beginning. It's a it's an O, and I kept trying to add a Q sound to it. So that was always tripping me up. So where's is that? Right. Well, I'll have to practice that uh, as we drive west uh, through the mountains. Uh, where's is that? Is uh, Morocco's Hollywood? Right. This is the center of their uh, film industry. Uh, and, and you can see it's a, a lovely town. Uh, and just, just to uh, mention a few movies that you might have seen that uh, at least partially were filmed there. Um, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, The Mummy, Gladiator. One of the James Bond movies was filmed here. And my favorite, Game of Thrones, right? Can't you just see uh, uh, Daenerys uh, wandering around in the streets here? This is this is Ait Benadu, which is the site that we've come to see uh, nearby. Ait Benadu <clears throat> is a is a Kassar, K S A R, which is just a, a fortified village. Uh, this was a stop on the trade route between the Sahara and Marrakesh, the ancient trade route there. It's an entirely uh, uh, adobe city, if you will. Um, and uh, there's the Kasbah down in the lower right. See if my cursor is working. I don't see it. Over the over to the I guess it's my right. It might be your left. The lower down is where you see the Kasbah, the, the little fortress that protects the city. We wander on up, and of course, there's lots of things to shop for. I like this shot because you know we've got a colorful local in the foreground, and then part of, part of the group down below. There's a nice shot. Ait Benadou. Here's Tariq, our guide, uh, you know, explaining some of the wares there or some of the things that are being sold. And from here, we head again over some mountains, another beautiful drive uh, to Marrakesh, right? Marrakesh, everybody knows Marrakesh, uh, certainly our generation, even if 
for no other in no other way from the Crosby, Stills and Nash song. Um, <laughs> and this is the <laughs> sorry. Am I am I dating myself? Yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but but our our travelers do, Sarah. I promise. All right. You. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. uh, so Marrakesh is kind of synonymous with this square, right? The Jama Al Fina Square. It's sort of the, the beating heart of, of Marrakesh. Um, uh, Atika took us through here on the virtual tour yesterday, but of course there was virtually nobody there with, with, you know, with the whole COVID thing. But this is a much more typical scene during the day. Uh, you know, everybody has set up their little booths where they're selling what, jewelry or handicrafts. Um, and of course in the evening, I don't have a good evening shot but evening is the place to be in this square. That's when the, the trained monkeys and the, and the sword swallowers and the fire eaters are out uh, 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 you know, performing you know, magic and comedy. Uh, you name it, you can see it here. And then dozens and dozens of food stalls. So a fun place to come out and spend an evening and have some dinner. And right next door is the souk, right? The, the bazaar of Marrakesh. Uh, we wandered through here yesterday on our virtual tour. So if you want to see a live action version of, of what I've got for the next few shots, you can uh, go back and see that recording on Sarah's uh, Facebook page. But again, the sort of everything colorful. Here's leather that probably came from Fez. Here's those colorful pillow covers that we discovered yesterday. Some tagines. I, I don't know why you didn't buy one of those and take it home in your suitcase. <laughs> well, I could have fit it actually, because I ended up with such a giant suitcase after all the things we bought. I was just worried I'd break it on the way home, but we brought home, I combined actually with a friend who was on the tour with me and we brought home three full-size carpets. We brought home a tea set. We brought home glassware. We brought home clothes. I mean, yeah, bring an empty suitcase or don't and just buy one. Yeah, uh, yeah, e easily done. Spices, of course, something that you see and smell everywhere you go. This is the one that we actually took our group into to have a little demonstration. So colorful. Not really. Do you know what these are for, Sarah? I see there's, a, you know, this is a leather shop. There's a couple of saddles back there. And they, they, these were, I think you put like bread in them or something. That's what it is, like a bread warmer, bread cozy. Yeah. And it looks like down below where they might put coal embers or something to keep it warm. Yeah. Um, these are the, the uh, Marjorelle Gardens. This, these are some beautiful uh, cultivated uh, gardens, gardens that were created by the French artist Jacques Marjorelle in the 1920s. Uh, it, it's just a beautiful um, botanical garden. Um, we always visit here. It was, it was purchased in the 1980s by the designer Yves Saint Laurent, and uh, he has created a, an actual little museum there that's uh, quite lovely as well. S I mean, so colorful. This is one of, for me, the highlights of Marrakesh. Um, another thing to note is that when we are there, we have actually three days this next uh, time we do it. And uh, we do have a bunch of options in Marrakesh. Marrakesh is completely full of things you can do. Uh, there's a couple of other gar secret gardens you can visit. Uh, we went hot air ballooning. That was one of the things we could do. Uh, and there's dozens and dozens of other activities. So um, when we go, we kind of can lay out for you all of the different options for your free time. You can do hammam. There's just a million choices. So Marrakesh is really fun to spend a bunch of days in because there is so much to do there. Um, my first time through, uh, this, this is where I had the, the family experience where Tariq uh, called up his mother and said, hey, I'm bringing 30 people for tea in a couple in a week, and uh, we, you know, invaded their home there in Marrakesh, and uh, and had tea one afternoon. So he's first of all, you have your hands washed. So Tariq, as our host, is going around uh, letting people wash their hands, and you see there's a little apparatus for that. Everybody's squished in there, cheek by jowl. Like I said, there was 30 of us, I think. But look at the table laid out there. Everybody gets a tea. And then look at that spread, right? Uh, just all the goodies you can imagine. 
And as a cultural connection experience, there's just nothing better than this, being invited into somebody's home. Um, but we also uh, visit um, the Bahia, I don't know if I'm saying that right, Bahia or Bahia Palace, right? There's a palace there in Marrakesh that we go and have a little guided tour. Again, it's that, that intricate detail uh, is what is so impressive from Moroccan architecture. This is a ceiling, if the perspective is a little hard to understand, that's just a vertical shot of a inlaid wooden ceiling. And this is looking straight up at, at an arch, you know, that's stucco decorated. That's the word I was searching for before. This is again, painted inlaid wood, again, also a ceiling. And the very last leg of our journey is back to Casablanca. We finish up in Casablanca where there's a big international airport, uh, an easy driving day, right? This is just a couple of hours on a highway. Uh, and we end up in Casablanca. And Casablanca is um, kind of a one trick pony, right? The, uh, the Hassan II mosque is super impressive. It might be the most impressive single edifice or building in Morocco, um, and it's right by the sea. Um, but other than that, uh, in, in my opinion, Casablanca, I mean, Casablanca obviously has some other uh, nice elements, but compared to the rest of Morocco, um, I just love seeing this mosque and, and that's pretty much all we plan to do during the tour. It looks like Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, you know. It looks like a beach town, like a California beach town. You know, we spent we spent we spend one night there. We get there in early afternoon in time to see this beautiful mosque. Uh, and if anybody you know wants to have dinner in Rick's Cafe from from the movie Casablanca, there is a Rick's Cafe. I don't know, you know, I think the the movie was filmed in a, a studio somewhere, but there is a Rick's Cafe. If the, if you want to have that experience, well, you know, you can stay an extra day, and you know, we encourage that sort of independence anyway. <clears throat> this is the interior of the mosque. Absolutely beautiful. And you can see this is a modern building, right? This was built in the 20th century. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I thought I had one last shot there, but we're done. Well, that was a very nice overview of Morocco, Reed. And uh, if you guys have any questions or you want to know any more about Morocco, you can certainly um, text us. And also the itinerary, the full itinerary is at Infant Tours if you want to see what's going on there. Um, we do actually have one more Morocco event that we are going to post tomorrow, and that's an interview with Atika, our local guide that Reed did a couple days ago. So I'll be posting that uh, tomorrow. Um, but any other thoughts or comments about Morocco? Oh, I'm kind of all Moroccoed out. Give me a half second to think about that. I, I, I'm, we pretty well covered it. We talked about every stop, um, but just maybe one last stab at trying to impart the, the feeling of Morocco, right? There's, there's a mysticism, there's a spiritual element. Maybe that's saying the same thing two ways. Uh, the, the genuine, genuine feeling of being welcome, the genuine feeling of being safe, the hospitality. I mean, you had your group, uh, you know, taken in for camel burger lunch. I had my group taken in for tea. Th those were spontaneous. I mean, they were arranged by us, but by you and I, but but we did it on the fly and there's going to be, you know, can't, can't make any specific promises, but there's going to be something like that. Uh, Morocco was a place that I, I was personally not interested in. It wasn't on my bucket list at all, but a lot of my regular travelers wanted to go. And I did my first tour there back in, I think, 2016 or 17. And it just knocked my socks off. And I, I can't say enough about it uh, as a safe, moderate, Muslim country, an important place for Americans to have that experience. Um, so that was a long winded answer to your question. No, and I would agree with you about that, that it was one, of, it's one of the countries that has surprised me the most in terms of just being um, a surprise around every corner. Every day is completely different from the previous day. And it's sort of a place that reveals 
itself to you over time because there's so many different sides to Morocco. I mean, you drive through a place that looks like Switzerland, but then you also go out to the desert, then you also go out to the sea. So there's so many different faces. And actually, we don't even see everything. We don't go out to any of the, the seaside communities to the south, which apparently are very beautiful. So um, there's just so much to see there. And I think it really is um, right now, just because Turkey is such a kind of question mark in some ways, I think that it is probably at the top of my list for a moderate Muslim nation to really get to know um, a, a really different culture. Uh, and the first thing you said to me when I decided to do a Morocco tour several years ago is you said, they're going to say the word merhaba to you all the time and you need to learn that word because that means welcome and they say that to you constantly and I thought you were joking you know of course but yeah no it's true like that's what you hear that's the number one word you hear is merhaba welcome 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 they're constantly welcoming you because they're really glad to have you and they're genuine about that so uh, yeah I I cannot recommend it more highly than that um so that's why we keep doing Morocco yeah, and, and I would I would add this just that the, you know we're, we've got our fingers crossed that we're going to be able to go this fall that the COVID thing is going to continue to go in the right direction. Morocco's doing a really good job. Uh, infection levels are very low. They're they're doing a really good job with the uh, vaccination program. Uh, people are required to wear masks in public, so we're feeling pretty good about it. And um, as Sarah, as you and I talk about all the time, you know. The international travel has just exploded in the last decade. And one of the biggest problems is, is crowds, right? And this fall, if anybody's intrepid enough to step out and, uh, and come with us to, to Morocco, I think you're gonna have that experience of, of, of being first in, being ahead of the curve of the big crowds, right? I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of people are traveling by then because for everybody's economy and whatnot, but uh, I, I really feel like this is a golden opportunity for those that have that kind of intrepid spirit to get out there early. Um, I think there's going to be a big reward of getting to enjoy these things without the big, massive commercial crowds. I agree with you about that. Um, we have a few questions about uh, weather and uh, best time of year to go. We typically like to go uh, kind of spring. I think that April, May is sort of perfect as long as it's not during Ramadan because that kind of complicates things or fall. So September, October, November. I wouldn't go in the middle of the season, not just because it's hot because it is, but also because that's a very popular tourist des destination with French people. And so it gets real crowded. Uh, so the spring and the fall are very nice. Something you might be surprised about though, when we were there last, I was there in what, April um, of 2019. And uh, it was cold. <laughs> there were days it was cold. So you have to bring lots of layers and really be prepared for anything because the Sahara Desert can be hot, but it can also be really cold. So just kind of remember, if you're going to Morocco, you have to plan for all different kinds of temperatures. And also, you're going to a place with a lot of sand. So uh, that's also something to consider. Bring clothes that are kind of loose and long to cover your arms and your legs. Just so you don't end up picking sand out of your crevices for days. Just tip from my point of view. <laughs> anyway, this has been an absolute delight. I hope that you guys have enjoyed our presentation on Morocco today. If you're interested in finding out about that tour, you can go to imprinttours.com. And just a little heads up about our next uh, adventures. Reed, would you like to introduce our next Where in the World? Where in the World next week, Reed? Where are we going in the world next week? I have to look up at my calendar. We are off to uh, the Danube uh, River Basin. Uh, we started with that a few weeks ago. Uh, on, on, uh, on Monday, we're going to have one of our local guides from Salzburg. Uh, Tuesday, Sarah will be doing some sort of uh, Central European cooking for us, I'm sure. Uh, Wednesday, we'll have uh, our local guide from Vienna, Gerhard. Uh, and then on Thursday, we'll have a virtual tour of the old town of Prague. Uh, and then um, I'm going to repeat the Danube Cruise PowerPoint show because the last time I did it, I, I had the wrong uh, screen up like, like I fumbled with today. Uh, so we're going to do that one again. Uh, and the week after that, uh, we're going to be doing Greece. We've got people lined up to, uh, to open up our eyes to the beauty and wonders of Greece. Yeah, we've got some amazing programming coming up in the next couple of weeks. So I hope you guys will stick around and keep checking out everything that we're doing. And we thank you so much for joining us. So have a good evening, Reed. Thanks a lot. You bet. Keep on traveling and travel with intent.